1905, in St. Petersburg, the printers there decided they wanted to be paid the same for punctuation as they were paid for letters. So they went on strike, and the strike led to other strikes, and that led to the Russian Revolution, and the whole of the history of the 20th century was changed, possibly on a semicolon. Taking the teaching challenge today as a former sports writer and celebrated Radio 4 dramatist, Lynn Truss caused her own revolution with a little book about punctuation called Eight Shoots and Leaves, which has become a worldwide bestseller. Lynn herself has become the unlikely leader of the movement to put punctuation back in its proper place. It was a real personal project, really, and I expected, if anything, there would only be a few people would sort of really think I was stupid for doing it and I don't know money and, um, and that would be the end of it. So it was great, suddenly everyone was interested in what I was interested in and, and that was very vindicating because, you know, I spent my whole life being a bit of a nerd, you know, who's, who has a minority interest, <laughs> so it's rather nice. But in an informal world of emailing and texting, will the pupils of Davison High School in Worthing share Lynn's zeal for punctuation? Year 11's English teacher is Ruth Needleson. Today we're going to be looking at punctuation and we're going to be looking at this because tomorrow, as you know, we're going to have a guest who's going to be teaching you um, who is an expert in punctuation. So we're going to start off by looking at the importance of punctuating your writing effectively. There's lots of characters in the class, that's the for definite. Um, they're a really, really bright bunch and are really quite confident at speaking their minds. So I think that's a, a nice way for a class to be not scared to speak out. I think they're quite excited about meeting her, but I don't think they've really got any idea of what kind of character she's going to be. So I'm hoping that she's got a good sense of humour because the girls are quite controversial. They do quite like to speak out and they'll probably tell her that they don't think punctuation is necessary. So I'd like her to prove them wrong. The school prepare for Lynn's arrival by resurrecting an old overhead projector at her request. There'll be no interactive whiteboarding during this lesson. It will be interesting if she's never actually taught children before, young adults, see how she copes with us asking awkward questions. I think a good teacher needs to be assertive, but also kind of fair and not too patronising. I would advise Lynn Trust not to patronise us um, in the class, because we do understand what she's probably trying to tell us. Can't be pushy with us. We're natural. We'd rather take things our own way, but I'm sure she'll be fine. I'm terrified of classrooms, actually. I think it's, it's like going to a prison or something, you know, you just no, don't know the rules, really, and you feel that you're... you're and, and I think when young people laugh at you for the wrong reason, that's the most scathing thing there, there is, and I suppose I try to avoid that in life. So actually going in deliberately to talk to some people who might think, Who, who's she? Why is she telling us this? You know, that, that seems to me very, very foolhardy. Before risking getting big laughs for all the wrong reasons, teacher and novice get confessional. So what are you planning on doing with the class today? I thought it could be quite organic, okay. since <laughs> I haven't prepared very much. <laughs> and, um, and I'm very much hoping the girls will ask me lots of questions to get things going, because um, I have no teaching skills at all. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. I'm sure that some <laughs> things will come naturally to you. And the girls are really chatty, so you don't, don't need to worry about that. They're very, very bright, yeah. which some people might find a little bit intimidating, but they are lovely as well. Mm. Um, is there a learning objective? That's probably how you, <laughs> how you do teaching, isn't it? Yeah. You, you set yourself you like an objective. To, yeah, what would you mm. like them to know by the end? Um, I didn't have a learning objective. I, I think if you tell me what I should have as an objective, that would really help me. I think maybe children today are a little bit lazy in their punctuation. So even if your objective was to make them more confident in knowing where to put punctuation by the end of the lesson, then that would be something that you could feel that you'd achieved perhaps by, oh, by the end. Okay. I'm really quite scared, I have to say. <laughs> it's not something I've done very much. And, um, and, I, and I'm always, I always think they, um, they're judging you. Do they judge you a great deal? Um, to be honest with you, yes, I suppose they do judge you. <laughs> But it can, be the most, it can be the most simple things from what you're wearing to what colour you've decided to dye your hair to the way in which you phrase things. But the girls, they're quite understanding, I think. They've, they've got a, a quite nice way. So if they see that you're nervous, I think they'll be quite good at making you feel comfortable. Mm. Perhaps in a way that boys might not. Boys might then play on that and maybe try to undermine you. But I think, no, they'll try to make you feel quite comfortable. So don't, don't be scared of them. I think that's important. So can I ask you a bit more then about how you're going to how are you going to start your lesson? <laughs> oh dear. Well, 
not having a plan, um, I thought I would just start by showing them some examples of things that um, can be punctuated either way. Yeah. Um, and, and talk about those and then see what develops. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as I got. An obvious sports fan, Lynn warms up in traditional pre-match style while the girls do some last minute cramming around the lunch table. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we are apart. And Ruth takes up her position to monitor the lesson. Hello. Hi. I really think Lynn should uh, uncross her arms at the moment because she looks a little bit defensive. Well, hello. <laughs> I'm not used to teaching. I'm a writer, so I spend a lot of time at home, well, mainly putting marks on things, as you probably know, because I'm, I'm famous for punctuation because I wrote this book called Eat Shoots and Leaves, which um, did amazingly well. I think a lot of people bought it because they thought it was about pandas and then um, <laughs> were too embarrassed to take it back when they realised realized their mistake. And they ended up finding out quite a lot about punctuation. So. What I'm going to do today is just talk to you a bit about, um, about what punctuation can do for you as writers. Oh, that's good. She's telling them exactly what they're going to be doing and what they should be expecting. Things. I'm going to show you one thing, first of all, that I will show you how to kind of correct. So this is my visual aid. It's quite old fashioned. <laughs> the girls are quite used to using the smart boards here. We'll read it as it is at the moment. Dear Jack, I want a man who knows what love is all about. You are generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we are apart. I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours? If you change the punctuation on this, you can get something quite different. Dear Jack, I want a man who knows what love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feelings whatsoever. <laughs> when we're apart, I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours, Jill? I think she's doing a good job of showing the girls that she's quite human, even though she cares about punctuation perhaps a little bit too much. And she's not quite the, the grumpy punctuation lady perhaps that they were expecting. So. If you just have the same words in the same order, but you change the punctuation, you can completely reverse the meaning. And I'm now going to use this smelly rag <laughs> to wipe that off because I'm going to show you one other thing. Here's, a, here's an example of a telegram that was sent once by somebody to his wife when he wasn't well. She read it as, not getting any, better come at once. <laughs> just making a rather rude joke here, so. We always enjoy that as well. So would someone like to demonstrate for me how that would be sort of more clear, that give across her the meaning she intended? Would anyone like to do that? Yes. Excellent. This is a good technique. She's getting them to come up and make marks on the board. So she's making it interactive. And we do try to have lots of different ways of learning. This is good for kinesthetic learners. That's what he actually intended, was to say not getting any better come at once. But she, of course, got thought, oh, great, not getting any. Better come at once. So she, um, she rushed off. OK, she's going straight on to another example now. I wonder whether the girls are feeling a bit bombarded by examples. They might actually want to ask her something. We are the Scots. Who could be prouder? But because they didn't punctuate it at all, it actually says we are the Scots who could be prouder, which is obviously quite the opposite of what they, what they intended to say. I'm quite literal minded. When I see that, I read what is there without the punctuation. I don't, uh, I don't adjust for it. If the question mark isn't there, I can't read that as a question. But I think it's different for people of your age. I mean, do you actually just adjust for it? Like a punctuation colossus, Lynn manages to straddle the generation gap and finally gets the girls talking. Yeah. Oh, Becky. I think that, like you said, modern technology kind of teenagers have to kind of guess the way because when you're emailing you don't use apostrophes or anything like that generally and I think teenagers have learnt how to kind of interpret what their friends mean. It's quite interesting because they don't seem to necessarily have the same view as Lynn here 
Yeah. Yes. And I think when, like, when you have a big paragraph of writing, people logically put their gaps in. There's not that many people that would just read the whole thing in one breath, so it kind of automatically puts punctuation in some places. Mm -hmm. And maybe in that occasion, people don't always think about what they're, where they're putting it. So they just kind of put it for their own sake. I'm not quite sure what the pupils would say they had learnt yet at this point. It seems to be more like a, a, an informal chat rather than actually teaching them something specific. The lesson might be conversational, but before long, Lynn addresses the evil that makes punctuation pygmies of us all, the computer grammar check. Well, it's also the problem, isn't there, that, that they don't allow you to write a sentence without a verb in it or something, which actually, if you're a writer, a creative writer, you sometimes do want to do that, or you want to start a sentence with and or something. It may tell yeah. you that you can't. I think Lynn's doing quite well now. Um, she's got quite a good rapport with the pupils. She's getting quite a lot back from them. Um, I mean, my, my main feeling about punctuation, obviously, is that it belongs to the era of print. It comes from, and then we have 500 years or something of print, where everything was on a page, and we looked at these marks, and they explained to us how to read something. Um, well, we've, we're leaving print behind. Obviously, we still have books. You still read books, I'm sure. But, but you're getting to the point where you do read things from screens, and I think you read from screens rather differently. I think when you're reading from a screen, you're actually picking up bits of information and, and sort of ordering them yourself in your head. When you read from a page, you're actually listening to the voice of the person who's written it. That's how I... It's an interesting point Lynn's making about how different forms of writing and the use of technology are actually changing the way that we use punctuation. But she hasn't actually said whether she feels that some punctuation will go out of date and will become redundant at all. I'm hoping maybe someone asks her something about that. Can you read a book now without looking for grammatical errors in the writing? Not at all, no. <laughs> it's completely impossible. But I, I, I was an editor before, you see, and I've, I think I've always just had that. We've had 500 years of books written for print and they've all been written with punctuation in them. And if people can't decode, if people can no longer decode those marks, they won't be able to see how good those writers were. And I think that's a terrible, terrible, terrible loss, you see. I want people to be able to read the great books of the past and appreciate what was so good about them. And if you can't actually follow the, the, the thoughts of Jane Austen because you can't see what she's doing with her punctuation, then I think that's a great loss. Do you not think that over time that's kind of changed, though? Because mm. like old English used to have a lot more like letters in the words and like no apostrophes and stuff. So maybe in I don't know a hundred years to come, we won't be spelling things the way that we do now. That's a really good point. No, of course that's right. I mean, it, language evolves all the time, and, and there's no there's never a moment when you can draw a line. Again, she's using some historical context, which I think the girls will be really interested in. Um, this might sound like a really silly question, but did there used to be a sign that was like a question mark and exclamation mark together? Yes, there was. It was in the 60s, though. It was very, very recently. Someone tried to invent... They invented something called the interrobang. <laughs> and the interrobang was a question mark with an exclamation mark over the top. I mean, I, I so often want to ask a question and exclaim at the same time, so I thought it was quite a useful thing. I think the problem was that the person who invented it actually trademarked it or, you know, tried to protect it um, and, and just sell it to certain typewriter manufacturers. Um, and, uh, and so they couldn't be bothered. I mean, everyone who, at those days, if you had a typewriter, you could backspace and put a <laughs> You could actually put two signs together anyway. So I think it just didn't, didn't take off because he actually tried to um, copyright it. I wonder whether Lynn's ever actually thought of introducing any of her own punctuation marks into standard English. I think we're going to go out, go for a walk, and have a look round at signs and things and see if there's anything that needs, needs repunctuating. Because we have punctuation repair kits, which have stick-on apostrophes and this lovely, lovely panda here, and um, and also little stickers that go on top of an, a, a rogue apostrophe that shouldn't be there, which says the panda says no, which I think is very nice. Um, we might all get prosecuted, but hey, you know it's education. It's going to be very educational. Not sure that's a good so, thing um, to be encouraging them to uh, cause damage. She can take responsibility if they get arrested. I think. Unleashed onto the streets of Worthing, the girls take no prisoners when it comes to missing apostrophes. I think there might be a problem with the What is the name is for the manners? I think it's smart though, don't they? Yeah. Christmas is have a apostrophe. 
After pounding the pavement in the name of punctuation, My shoes are full of Lynn and the girls meet up with teacher Ruth, who just happens to be sitting on Worthing Beach. Right, so yes. What did you find? Um, there was a sign and it said, it's Christmas, without an apostrophe. Oh, I'm, I'm just Can't horrified. Be Christmas if there's no apostrophe. Just horrified. Megan, what about you? Um, and on a pub, a sign that we thought today's special without an apostrophe before the air. Again, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. bad, really bad. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Panda says no. I saw today's menu without an apostrophe. Yeah, so yeah. that seems to be one that's cropping up quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Any more? I'm sure I've seen a cream tease with an apostrophe. Cream teas with yeah, an apostrophe, with an apostrophe. yes. yes. Really well, there is one. there is this law, you know, that for all the apostrophes left out of today's, <laughs> there's one put in cream teas. That's that's right. where they all go. I it balances right. out in the world. <laughs> all right. So, have you enjoyed today? How did you find the lesson earlier? It was, it was really good. Yeah. 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 It was really interesting. Good. It was interesting yeah. to see like how you could interpret things. Like if you look really closely, how the different meanings appeared. The letter was just so funny. Yeah. Good. Do you think you'll be more careful about your punctuation from now on? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you've had a good day and it was really nice to meet Lynn as well, wasn't it? So I think we need to go back to school and do some proper work now. With no arrests amongst class members and the town's shopkeepers much wiser, Lynn reflects on her day as a teacher. I think what will happen when I get home is I'll just think of all the ways I could have done it better, that's all. I always do that anyway, any, any kind of bit of broadcasting, I was like, you always think, oh, if only I'd said this, you know, that would, that would have made it clearer. I'm sure I'll think of all sorts of things that would have been the better thing to say. Lynn's lesson, I don't think I would necessarily call it a lesson, to be honest with you. Um, there was no plan, so there wasn't really any structure. At most points, I wasn't quite sure where it was going. However, for her defence, I think that she has the charisma to carry that off so the girls are still interested and engaged so she kind of had that on her side. I really enjoyed the way that the kids you know those girls interacted they were just listening thing they were very very attentive and and it was just so it was very good now I felt the words still have uh, great power because we were communicating with each other very well. Oh, I think they really enjoyed it. I mean, they've actually been writing essays with me for quite a few lessons now, so it's nice for them to have a lesson that was lots of chatter and lots of conversation, and they love being allowed to ask questions. I mean, they'd do that for an hour every lesson if you let them. So I think they really liked her. I think she had a really good relationship with the girls. What I fear for in education, or I have been fearing for, is that people don't get a chance to ask questions. I always think that that's gone because people are using the internet and the internet is a place where you just, you know, it has the information stored. If you're clever, you can find it. It gives you nothing back, really. It just, it just is this repository of information. And I'm really fearful for that, that people don't get a chance to ask questions. So actually being with people who found it very natural to ask questions and listen to the answers and then ask further questions showed that the Socratic tradition is not lost after all. Mm -hmm.